Yeah. So the music industry is um, you have to have the skill sets to be in the industry you're in, you know, to actually know how to do it. When I was publishing art from television commercials, you know, it was art, you know, it was computer generated images that are in the computer. How do you get it out of the computer, get it printed on acetate has never really been done. I'm an English major. I, I think I've said this before from Hobart College. You know, it's like, what do I know? I don't know. You know, the best skills of an entrepreneur is you must find the people to get you the answers who can really, you know, make, make, you know, you, what you are as an entrepreneur is a, um, you're an assembler. You're, 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 you're the glue. Everyone's working around you. Hey everyone, this is Devin Miller here with another episode of The Inventive Expert. I'm your host, Devin Miller, the serial entrepreneur that's grown several startups into seven and eight figure businesses, as well as the founder and CEO of Miller IP Law, where he helps startups and small businesses with their patents and trademarks. If you ever need help with yours, just go to strategymeeting.com, grab some time with us to chat, and we're always here to help. Now today we've got another great guest on the podcast, Craig Wolf. And uh, Craig, we're going to be talking about a, a few great topics, including uh, how to plan on a, a business taking off and the problem or and the different problems that might uh, create when the business does take off and do well. Um, keeping up with and uh, choosing uh, who you want to work with as you grow, um, and and uh, also dealing with uh, when you're having to deal with the uh, shortages and delays uh, for some of your products. And uh, lastly, but not least, uh, client management and uh, when you're dealing with the uh, with the the growth and some of those issues. So. With uh, that much as a introduction, welcome on the podcast, Craig. Uh, hi, Dad. Really great to be here again. Absolutely. And for those that didn't catch it, so Craig was on the the sister podcast, The Inventive Journey. So if you want to go hear Craig's full journey, uh, definitely make sure to to go check out his episode there. Um, but for those that haven't had a chance to to catch out that or catch up on that episode, uh, take a minute or two just to introduce yourself. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so anyway, I was. Uh basically in the publishing business, uh, creating artwork from television commercials for the art market, uh, for Coca-Cola, Anheuser-Busch, Nike, um, different companies, marketed the artwork for the California Raisins, Gumby, all these things. That was our business. And, um, and then, <laughs> strangely, we took an idea as a little fun thing of creating rubber ducks that look like celebrities. And in the last interview, I explained how that came about, <laughs> um, which... Um, was a fortuitous um, little side thing that blew up. Um, and that is really interesting how one little thing in your business can change your trajectory overnight. And suddenly you have a brand new business. And long story short, I won't get into it this time again, but we sold off the animation. We became all ducks. And um, just like we were the leader in publishing art from television commercials, now we're kind of the top custom duck manufacturer in the world. And we do it for people from... SeaWorld, Jersey Boys on Broadway, Barry Mantle, we do it, Yankees, Cubs, you know, to people all over the world who want a rubber duck made for them. Plus, we have our own line of all these celebrities. So, um, you know, when it, as John Lennon said, life's what happens when you're making other plans. And here we are in the duck world. <laughs> who knows? Oh, that's awesome. So, no, it sounds like it's a, a fun world to play in and uh, definitely a, a good area to be in. Uh, always funny how uh, how li or where life takes you. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so now is, uh, with that is a, a great introduction, kind of uh, diving into a few of the topics at hand in, in no particular order. But one of the things that I think, um, you know, people oftentimes don't anticipate or don't think about is the problem of when a business does start to take off and kind of what problems that might create and how you deal with that. I mean, I think people anticipate or say, okay, ones if we run out of money or we, you know, have issues with marketing or we can't get the right people or we're bootstrapping and those are anticipated. But on the flip side, if you do, if the business does do well and it does take off, it still does, it's a good problem to have, but it still creates a, a set of problems. So walk us through a little bit of kind of what are those, some of those problems you might be facing and how do you kind of go about dealing with them? Right. I mean, it, you know, when Celebridux um, started, you know, we had like, you know, two of them, <laughs> you know, we since done, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, but we had two, Betty Boop and Groucho Marx, mm. got the licenses for them. And, you know, and that was huge for us, you know, getting the licenses, starting the company. And like I said, I explained that in the other interview, but there, there is a point 
oftentimes for companies when something happens that changes the tra trajectory, as I was explaining, and and no matter how prepared you think you are, um, it, it's it's big because it, all of a sudden your company almost like doubles in size, triples in size over. And you have to make really hard decisions because you probably have now a lifestyle that is manageable to you and work mm. life balance, family, you know, and and all of a sudden, you know, you're it's so much bigger and the demands are so much greater. And your clients, you know, they're not just like, you know, maybe a smaller store, but, you know, like famous celebrities and like I say, sports teams. And, you know, it's a lot of pressure. I mean, you know, you have a promotional giveaway with the team like the Yankees and they promote it. It's not like you can be one day late, you know, it's not, that's the day, that's the day, you know? So imagine multiplying that by doing this for, you know, umpteen companies all over the world, plus mm. your own line, because you keep expanding your celebrities. Cause I remember the guy who wrote the Pez book told me this, he said, uh, look on Pez collectibles. He said, you know, Craig, you really don't become anything until you have a line till people can collect it till it's more than one or two or three. So we very, very deliberately kept expanding, expanding, expanding at the same time we're doing the custom work. But at a certain point, as I described in that last um, interview, when the Philadelphia 76ers, you know, wanted that Allen Iverson duck and the company really blew up and then I had to sell off the animation became old ducks. That was huge. You know, we suddenly have so much work in a factory, you know, they have to be able to keep up with that amount of work. And it's a lot. And, and if it wasn't enough then, um, which we could keep up with, it doesn't compare that when you do grow bigger, hmm. you're more noticed. So when now things are exponentially getting even bigger, so your the amount of workload, because now you're kind of successful, and now it becomes that much bigger from what your original line was when you expanded. You already have now a bigger line, but now it's becoming a huge line because everyone's finding out about you. They see your stuff all over. They see on the internet, articles, this, that, the other thing. And um, and then the whole duck market exploded, which is hard to fathom. But if you have a Jeep out there, you know what I'm talking about, the duck and Jeep thing where all the Jeep owners are ducking each other, putting ducks on their windshields. And, and they're opening duck stores all over the world. And somehow we landed in this market that we had no idea of the breadth of it. And then when mm. we got into it, it even expanded it that much more. So it was very artful to make a decision. How are you going to live your life and manage this growth? And one of the key things, I'll tell you this, at least from my point of view, is don't try and take on more than you realistically can do. Don't be afraid to say no and be very, very upfront what you can do, what you can't do, and what your real lead times are going to be. Because the world changed after COVID and you can no longer make promises that you could pre-COVID world. Hmm. No, I think that's a, a lot of good learning. That, and it is kind of one where you, you know, you plan for the business to take off, or you hope for the business to take off, you plan for it. And then all of a sudden these things start to pop up and kind of along that, those lines. And one of the things we talked a little bit about before was, you know, you, you start to land the deals, you start to get traction, and then all of a sudden you're hit with either shortages or delays. And so how do you go about kind of managing, you know, relationships with suppliers and customers and clients when you're hitting shortages, hitting delays, and, you know, you're not delivering on, you know, what or delivering on expectations? Well, I always say this entrepreneurs, if you're not good with people, um, don't be an entrepreneur. Because part of being an entrepreneur is managing people's expectations, forming relationships, um, getting along with people, dealing with when things aren't working right. You're going to have people who are, you know, I mean, they're accountable. Remember, a lot of your clients are accountable to their clients and celebrities and big companies. And, you know, so they're under a lot of pressure. Hmm. So if that's not your nature, you know, to be able to get along and deal with that, um, you are going to have trouble with it. I, I don't think the best entrepreneurs are the people who are the smartest and really have a good business sense and can read profit and loss statements. I think the best entrepreneurs are visionaries and people who know how to relate to people, know how to use people, know how to bring people in to help them. So like when my business hit this crossroads, you have a choice. You can totally transform your business model, what got you here, 
and you can go, you know what, we're growing so fast. I'm getting new factories. I'm bringing on more overhead, more people. We're going we're gonna to really just up it. I did not go that route. Um, I did it differently. I, I think I might have said this last time. I go, I know who, what got me here. I know who brought me to the dance. I'm going to work with the same people, the same people I trust, you know, my shipping brokers, my factory, the same people. And if we can't do it all, we'll just tell people it will take a little bit longer. But I'm going to work with people I trust because at the end of the day, you're known by the quality of the product you produce. So just because you can do more um, isn't necessarily better. And, you know, when you bring on all those people, I just want to say you're really your margins are really going down. You're shrinking. You say, well, no, you're taking on more work. I can still take on a hell of a lot more work. I'm just going to be more realistic on the lead times. Mm -hmm. um, and people who say, you know, I remember this, you know, um, one of the biggest retailers in the country. I won't name names. Everyone knows who they are. And I remember when if it was when COVID hit or this or that, and they just start canceling orders for people on people, you know, vendors who, who were making had POs and were told to do it. And then they just canceled it. And the vendors were just stuck. I've had that happen because I had a huge contract um, with Kiss. I might, I don't know if I mentioned this. It was like you know forty thousand dollars for the license, and then all of a sudden you have a dock strike in L.A. And what did one of these huge retailers, who I'm again I'm not going to name their name, they go, well it's three days late, we're canceling it. So all of a sudden you know you're there you are four thousand dollars left with all the inventory, and they were going to take the whole thing. You got the license for them. And they're not going to do it. So fortunately, Gene Simmons is a great guy. He said, just sell them off over time and work off that royalty. Not everyone is like that. Um, and it worked out great. We sold everything. In fact, people are still begging us to bring it back, back in. We could have sold 10 times more. But you really have to know how to manage um, these, this expansion in the best way you can without putting yourself in greater debt and overhead and creating a lifestyle that is going to make you miserable. So yes, I can tell you at one point I had one of our clients, you know, the Grand Old Opry, you know, uh, love those folks. And we did it for Blake Shelton's restaurant theme, theme uh, bar and everything. We did these Old Red. That's one of his famous songs, Old Red. And um, we did a dog, whole red, holding a bone. And then they called me like when COVID was seen, they said, okay, we need more. You know, I said, they said, when can we have them for the holidays? This is six months before the holidays. I said, I can't guarantee it. You go, what do you mean you can't guarantee it? I, you know, we have to have it. I go, you know what? We're the one company in the industry who, when you had to have it there, we're the ones. So if I can't guarantee something, nobody can. And it's just, but, and they said, well, it seems a little bit unprofessional. <laughs> well, like I say, we're the leader in the industry. I'm telling you. There are too many things out of our control with the supply chain, with boats, with shipping, with this, with that. And she goes, well, I'm going to have to cancel the order. I go, no problem. Honestly, no problem. I would rather people cancel orders on me than give them false expectations. But, you know, 98% of the people are so happy that we will take on their job <laughs> because there's no other factory in the world that will do this detail. There's no other factory in the world that will just run a thousand. Every other factory wants to run three to five thousand. We are the only option. So I said, if you'll be patient with us, you will absolutely love your end result. But it could, or it used to be four to six months, could be six to nine, could be a year. And 98% of the people will work with it. You must manage expectations up front. If you don't, that's where in your growth, you're going to really take it in the shorts. They, they will, business will be very unforgiving if you are not totally transparent at the very beginning of what it could pot the worst case scenario. So, I mean, that's my best advice with that. Clear communication. And if they won't live by that, you don't want them as a client, you know, because you can't, don't promise what you can't be 100% sure of. No, and I like, and I think that you know, or one of the great takeaways that you'd uh, hit on a couple times was, you know, I think communications, you know, when you are or hitting delays, you are hitting shortages. One is just be honest with people and let them know, hey, this is a, you know, we're facing this issue. It's abnormal for us, and we're working our way through it. And here's the options of what we're going to be remedying it, and and here's what we're going to be doing to, to make sure we deliver. And I think most of the time, if you're willing to, um, you know 
be honest and transparent, communicate, people are much more understanding. Though I think the worst thing is is that when you just go silent or try and ignore the problem or just keep pushing it off, people or people just it it just turns them off and they lose all trust and uh, willingness to to be patient. The kiss of death, they're not to be responsive. So if you're one of those people who just likes to do texts. I suggest respond to emails or in, your inconvenience, you know, your convenience and not get back to people. Don't be an entrepreneur. No, don't, don't run businesses that it's people related. My oddly, and I think I might have said this before on the website, that corporate phone number is my cell phone. <laughs> you know, I don't mind telling people. I want them to always be able to get to me. I want the people to always send me an email. They know always hear back from me. Even if I can't get to them, I'll send an email back saying I got it. I will get back to you. Just let me finish these up. Communication, communication, communication. And there are a lot of people, Devin, I'm really surprised. I don't know if it's a generational thing. We're not good at that. You know, they really not good at getting back to people or not doing it in a timely manner or not managing people's expectations. And then when they're called on that, they get like, they get upset, you know, but the Mm -hmm. client has every right to be kept into the loop 100% nonstop. Um, they are your bread and butter. They're giving you their trust and they absolutely do, should have access to you at all times. Yeah. At night, you know, fine. They can still send messages. I'll deal with it in the morning, but they have to know that you're always there for them. And I feel as an entrepreneur, that's the best entrepreneurs really make themselves available and their client always feels they're never left in the dark without answers or just like ignored. Worst thing you could ever do, ignore. No, oh, I'm I'm right there with you. And you know, I'm I'm in an industry that's uh, notoriously terrible for that, which is the legal industry. And you know, the oftentimes with the the legal industry, the average for just responding, whether it's a phone call or a text or a email or that, is three to five days. And so wow. you, may, <laughs> you may reach out on a Monday, and you may not hear back till Friday or even the, or to the following week on an average. And that doesn't mean wow. that there are even worse offenders than that. And so I certainly am. I am the, the proponent, even. If you're if you really are busy and you get caught up during a day and you say nothing else, just respond back. Say, hey, really busy day to day. Apologize. I haven't had a chance to respond. I'll make sure to get this taken care of tomorrow or, or respond to you in full. And at least they know, hey, you saw this. You are abnormally or weren't able to respond to it, but you're you're still paying attention to it and that you'll get taken care of. And I think if you can just give them that transparency is again, but also to be responsive, it can it builds a much more a, a much greater degree of good goodwill on a, on a lot if of you're things. the type of person who feels intruded upon by the constant input you're not going to be an entrepreneur i mean you're not going to be a very good one because the best entrepreneurs are very responsive and in, in, in my experience the best are very responsive they, their clients really feel their concern for them and that they're going to do everything to go to the mat to take care of them and they don't have to hunt them down to get answers and they know they're fighting on their behalf and um and you know i do feel has a lot to do with our success i mean it's not just that we're going to do low custom runs it's our quality i i think if you talk to every one of our clients and you know if you go to china and go to the factory you have a new factory and you say okay can i talk to people you work with no they won't let you <laughs> but me you know what, Devin? I you said I want to talk to every one of your clients you've done jobs for. Can you give me phone numbers and tell me who to talk to? I go at it. You can go at it. You know, yep. see what they say. You know that they're your best advertisement. You know, so if you're the type of person who's who's burning bridges or is not creating har- harmonious relationships, um, you're probably again, as I like to say, um, if it's not natural to you then you have to find somebody in, you have to create a business where you have someone in your business who is that way. Now, a lot of times, usually the founders are that way. But if you're one of those founders who you just like sitting behind the computer and you're not a people person, you must have a people person in every successful entrepreneurial venture, in my opinion. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. So well, we look, time has already fly, flown by. We barely scratched the surface on a lot of these topics, and yet we're already reaching towards the end of the, the podcast. So we'll have to have you back on to maybe one of our <laughs> sister podcasts again to, to continue on with the great conversations. But uh, at least for today, um, for this, uh, for the inventive expert, I always like to wrap up with one question. So we're going to jump to that now, which is within your industry, what is the biggest myth and why is it wrong? Yeah. So the major industry is um, you have to have 
the skill sets to be in the industry you're in, you know, to actually know how to do it. When I was publishing art from television commercials, you know, it was art, you know, it was computer generated images that are in the computer. How do you get it out of the computer, get it printed on acetate has never really been done. I'm an English major. I, I think I've said this before from Hobart College. You know, it's like, what do I know? I don't know. You know, the best skills of an entrepreneur is you must find the people to get you the answers who can really, you know, make, make, you know, you, what you are as an entrepreneur is a, um, you're an assembler. You're, 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 you're the glue. Everyone is working around you. So, um, you don't have to know how it comes out of that computer. With the ducks, I still to this day don't fully understand how they make one of them. I know people are amazed. Have you been to China? Have you seen? No. All your factories, you're, you're leaving the industry. You don't know? No, not exactly. I kind of know, you know, which seems crazy. I don't have to know. Mm. Um, I have people who do know. I have my factories. I have a trust. I know enough. You don't have to have a skill of actually knowing what it is of the industry you're in a hundred percent, but you do have to have the absolute expertise in that industry by having people around you who make up for what you lack. So I might be more of a visionary of, I can see these ducks that look like celebrities. I think it'd be huge, you know, like it looks like um, Marilyn Monroe. It looks like, you know, or you just, you see it, what it could be, or artwork, the Coke bears. When I talked to Coca-Cola, can you imagine marking your artwork like, Disney with Mickey Mouse, only the Coke Poet. You have to have the vision. Do I know how to do it? No. That's why the, you don't have to know how to do it. You have to know how to find people who know how to do it and get along with them no, and draw I, them I, in. I think that's a, a great, great myth to dispel and uh, certainly some uh, great takeaways. So, well, now as we are wrapping up the episode, if people want to reach out to you, they want to be a customer, they want to be a client, they want to be an employee, they want to be an investor, they want to be your next best friend, any or all of the above, what's the best way to reach out to you, contact you, find out more? You know, the cell phone is right on the website, 530-446-5231, um, celebriducks.com, C-E-L-E-B-R-I-D-U-C-K-S.com. We have a Facebook page. It has tons of articles and interviews. Your interview's on there. You know, the, the other one from the last one. Um, we're, I'm one of the easiest people to get to get hold of. Um, info at celebriducks.com. You send me an email. If, if, if you don't hear back, I didn't get it. Um, we get, like I say, Devin, we get back to everybody. Easiest company in the world to, to get hold of. Awesome. Well, I definitely encourage people to reach out, take advantage, to support a great business. If nothing else, uh, make a new best friend. So with that, thank you again, Craig, for coming on the podcast. It's been a fun. It's been a pleasure. Now, for all of you that are listeners that are out there, um, if you can help us to share this expertise with even more startups and small businesses to help them along their journey to success, just go ahead and uh, go or click uh, share, subscribe, and leave us a review. Definitely helps to reach even more businesses along to help them along their journey. And on that note, if along your journey you ever need help with patents, trademarks, or anything else with your startup or your small business, just go to strategymeeting.com, grab some time with us to chat, and we are always here to help. Well, thank you again, Craig, for coming on the podcast and wish the thank next you, leg Kevin. of your journey. Absolutely. Always and wish a pleasure, the next leg, man. Always wish a the pleasure. next wish the next leg of your journey even better than the last. Yeah. Thank you, man.